The Titans, Cyclops, Paul Bunyan, Pecos Bill, the Jolly Green Giant, or Jack's Beanstalk Giant, all these characters bring to mind fictional, mythological imaginings. But what about in actual, literal Earth history? Many people assume these so-called tall tales have no basis in fact, but is that true? From the Bible to Greek mythology, Native American legends to conquistador diaries, nursery rhymes to newspapers, from Josephus and Homer to modern-day historical accounts and archaeological finds, evidence of giant human beings living on Earth is abundant. The execration texts of 12th Dynasty Egypt, 1900 BC, now on display at the Berlin Museum, mention by name the Anakim Giants and Ashdod, the city of the giants. One of the most incredible accounts of ancient giants was by Hellenistic geographer Eumachus, who told of two separate 36-foot human skeletons which were allegedly uncovered by Carthaginians somewhere around 300 BC. The historian Josephus, who lived in Hebron, home of biblical giants, wrote that he had on multiple occasions dug up human bones of enormous size. He also wrote about the people of Judah facing the giants of Hebron, saying, There were till then left a race of giants, who had bodies so large and countenances so entirely different from other men, that they were surprising to the sight, and terrible to the hearing. The bones of these men are still shown to this very day, unlike to any credible relations of other men. Josephus also wrote of Eleazar, a Jewish giant that stood over ten feet tall, being one of the hostages the king of Persia sent to Rome to ensure peace. Roman Emperor Aulus Vitellius also mentioned this writing that Darius, son of Artabanes, was sent as a hostage to Rome. He took with him, with diverse presents, a man seven cubits high, a Jew named Eleazar, who was called a giant by reason of his greatness. Roman author Pliny the Elder wrote that during the reign of Claudius, a nine-foot, nine-inch giant named Gabarus was brought from Arabia to Rome and placed head of the Adutrix legions. The area today called Baca, near the Valley of Hinnom, was long known as the Valley of the Rephaim, or Valley of the Giants. The Ras Shamra texts, discovered in 1928 in Syria, are historical documents mentioning the economy, history, and religion of Rathsharma, ancient Ugarit, as well as the giant Rephaim, which then inhabited the area. In 135 AD, soon after the bar Kochba War, Buber's Tanhuma describes Roman Emperor Hadrian's encounter with Rabbi Jonanin ben Zakai's, in which he was shown the skeletons of fallen Amorites measuring 18 cubits, or 30 feet tall. According to Jacques de Voragin, St. Christopher, the Christian martyr, was of gigantic stature, had a terrifying mane, and was twelve kudis tall, a kudi being slightly longer than a modern foot. In an old book called History and Antiquities of Allerdale, there is a report of a giant found by one Hugh Hodson of Thornway in Cumberland, England, during the Middle Ages. The report states that, the said giant was buried four yards deep in the ground, which is now a cornfield. He was four yards and a half long, and was in complete armor, his sword and battle axe lying by him. His teeth were six inches long and two inches broad. The Cocopa Indian tribe have an oral history describing giants of the past able to carry logs so heavy that six humans failed to budge. Considering that humans can carry on average twice their body weight, and the average human is 150 pounds, this means the logs would have weighed over 1,800 pounds. In H. T. Wilkins' book, Mysteries of Ancient South America, he retold old Peruvian tales of a time during their past when a race of giants came from the Pacific Ocean on ships and invaded the lowlands of Peru, forcing the Inca to retreat high into their mountain strongholds in the Andes. The Incas said that some of the giants were so huge that from the knee down they were as tall as a tall man. The Inca legends also closely parallel the biblical account of Sodom and Gomorrah, saying that these giants brought no women with them, and because they were too big for the Inca women, they became homosexual, and one day, while they were publicly polluting the marketplace with these practices, a fire from heaven rained down on them and consumed them. Gary Nelson wrote, Growing up in Nevada, I had heard stories of the Sitaka from the Paiute Indians that lived in the area. 
They told of red-haired men and women of light-colored skin as tall as twelve feet who originally lived in the area when the Paiutes had first arrived. Evidently, these human giants liked to eat the Indians, so they had problems making friends. The Indian tribes of the area finally joined and ambushed the giants, killing most of them on the spot. The remaining giants took refuge in a cave. The Indians demanded they come out and fight, but the giants refused, so the Indians piled brush into the cave and set it on fire. Any giants that did run out were shot with arrows. The remaining giants were asphyxiated. Many early explorers, including Vespucci, Drake, Coronada, De Soto, and Narvaez, all mention encountering giant human beings in their journeys. The first Europeans to sail along the Patagonian coast were Ferdinand Magellan and his crew in 1520. Their first meeting with the Tehulches was recorded by Antonio Pigafetta. One day, when no one was expecting it, we saw a giant, completely naked by the sea. He danced and jumped and singing, spread sand and dust over his head. He was truly well built. The captain named these kind of people Patagoni. They have no houses but huts, like the Egyptians. They live on raw meat and eat a kind of sweet root, which they call kapak. The two giants we had on board ship ate their way through a large basket of biscuits and ate rats without skinning them. They drank a half bucket of water at once. When Hernando de Soto reached the territory of the Apalachi around Tallahassee, he recorded meeting a giant Indian chief whom he described as a man of monstrous proportions. At the same time as de Soto, across the continent near present-day California and Arizona, Francisco Coronado was leading a team to search for the legendary beautiful Seven Cities of Cibola and ran into several tribes of giants. Pedro de Castaneda, one of Coronado's team members, later wrote a complete history of the expedition mentioning their meetings with giant Indians. In one such passage, he wrote of their encounter with the Seri Indian tribe. Don Rodrigo Maldonado, who was captain of those who went in search of the ships, did not find them, but he brought back with them an Indian so large and tall that the best man in the army reached only to his chest. It was said that other Indians were even taller on the coast. In around 1542, within months of De Soto and Coronado's expeditions, five-year-old Fray Diego Duran moved with his Christian missionary family to central Mexico and spent most of his life there. During his travels, he recorded several times coming in contact with giant Indians. It cannot be denied that there have been giants in this country. I can affirm this as an eyewitness, for I have met men of monstrous stature here. I believe that there are many in Mexico who will remember, as I do, a giant Indian who appeared in a procession of the Feast of Corpus Christi. He appeared dressed in yellow silk and a halberd at his shoulder and a helmet on his head, and he was all of three feet taller than the others. In his book, History of the Indies, Joseph de Acosta also tells a tale similar to Duran's. When I was in Mexico, in the year of our Lord 1586, they found one of those giants buried in one of our farms, which we call Jesus de Le Monte, of whom they brought a tooth to be seen, which, without augmenting, was as big as the fist of a man, and according to this, all the rest was proportionable, which I saw and admired at his deformed greatness. Halfway around the world in 1575, when the Tartars invaded Poland, Jacobus Niezabilo Vias defeated a soldier of gigantic size who fought within their ranks. After the battle, the Polish army recorded that his body was of so prodigious a bulk that his carcass reached to the navel of any ordinary person standing by the side of it. Throughout history and all over the world, hundreds of giant skeletons have been discovered, unearthed, recorded, and in recent times photographed and preserved Thanks to the suppression and censorship by the Smithsonian and other establishment organizations, however, most people are completely unaware of these amazing discoveries. Matt Tufar wrote, The Smithsonian Institute, National Geographic, the Discovery Channel, and any of the officially sanctioned archaeological expedition teams between the whole lot of them have supposedly not been able to cough up one single solitary bone fragment, fossil, or artifact that would evidence these Nephilim. Has the elite-controlled academic mainstream covered something up? Here, then, are a number of these reports about discoveries of the remains of human or humanoid giants. Q. 
Keep in mind, numerous times these findings were turned over to government authorities, particularly to the Smithsonian, by conscientious and well-meaning citizens, only to have these artifacts then disappear permanently. In 1456, a 23-foot-tall human skeleton was reported and removed from beside a river in Valence, France. In 1577, a 19-and-a-half-foot giant skeleton was found under an overturned oak tree in the canton of Lucerne. In 1613, a giant skeleton was found near Chaumont Castle in France and reported to be 26 feet 6 inches tall. In 1829, the Burlington News reported on workers digging into a mound being used to furnish building material for a new hotel in Chesterville, Ohio, when they dug up a giant human skeleton. In 1833, soldiers digging at Lompoc Rancho, California, discovered a giant male skeleton 12 feet tall with double rows of teeth surrounded by giant weapons. In July 1877, four prospectors in Eureka, Nevada, found and chipped out several human leg and foot bones encased in solid quartzite. One of the leg bones from heel to knee was 39 inches long, twice the size of a modern-day adult human. In 1879, the Indianapolis News reported that a 9-foot, 8-inch skeleton was excavated from a mound near Brewersville, Indiana. In 1891, Workmen excavating near Crittenden, Arizona, discovered a huge stone sarcophagus eight feet below the surface, which contained the mummified body of a 12-foot-tall giant with six digits on each limb. The Chicago Record reported on October 24, 1895, that a mound near Toledo, Ohio, was found to hold 20 skeletons, seated and facing east, with jaws and teeth twice as large as those of present-day people and beside each sat large bowls with curiously wrought hieroglyphic figures. In December 1895, a 12-foot, 2-inch fossilized Irish giant was found by a Mr. Dyer while prospecting for iron ore in Antrim country, Ireland. Strand magazine featured a picture of the giant at a London rail depot. It weighed two tons, had six-digit limbs, and was exhibited in Dublin, Liverpool, and Manchester for sixpence a person attracting scientific men as well as gaping sightseers. After a legal dispute regarding ownership, however, the exhibit disappeared from public display forever. Eighteen giant human skeletons were found in mounds next to Lake Delavan, Wisconsin, in May of 1912. Belois College professors and students excavated the site, uncovering giants from 7.6 feet up to 10 feet tall, with double rows of teeth and 24 digits. The Washington Post, on June 22, 1925, and the New York Herald Tribune, June 21, 1925, reported that a mining party found skeletons measuring 10 to 12 feet, with feet 18 to 20 inches long, near Sisaquish, Mexico. The Los Angeles Times, on October 2, 1927, reported explorers in Mexico located large human bones near Tapextla, indicating a race of gigantic size. The Review Minter of June 19, 1931, reported on two giant skeletons found in Lovelock Cave, Nevada. Both were wrapped in a gum-treated fabric, one eight and a half feet tall and the other just under ten feet tall. A giant skull and jawbone from the discovery are still on display at the Humboldt Museum in Nevada. In the late 1950s, during road construction in southeast Turkey, Many tombs containing the remains of giants upward of 16 feet tall were uncovered. Leg bones were measured to be about 120 centimeters, or 47.24 inches. In 2004, an anonymous Aramco Saudi oil industry technician found and uncovered a 15 foot tall complete giant human skeleton while prospecting. Police quickly came and seized all cameras. The Saudi military swiftly took control of the site and nothing was ever publicly released about it since. The technician who uncovered it managed to take and circulate only one photo of the giant. Matt Tufor wrote, What I found to be ominously indicative, and yet also a backhanded confirmation of the authenticity of this discovery, is the flurry of photoshopped Nephilim remains that popped up on the internet shortly afterwards. In an apparent attempt to muddy the waters and create a discrediting factor, 
To this day, if you Google for giant skeleton, you see an abundance of these faked Photoshop giants. Just in the short time I spent recently researching for this chapter, I ran into at least five or six reports regarding the Smithsonian Institute receiving extraordinary artifacts and evidence from dutiful citizens who thought they were handing over their findings to the highest and most reliable authorities, only to realize later that Smithsonian had made it all disappear. Hollywood has even made a veiled, snickering reference to this bizarre trend. Recall the famous Smithsonian warehouse scene at the end of the first Indiana Jones movie. Note how these many giant discoveries are made by a wide range of people with a variety of jobs and interests, unlike supposed dinosaur discoveries which are always made by highly invested parties. Also note how the Smithsonian has entire museums filled with fake dinosaur skeletons, yet has never displayed a single giant human skeleton. Even though they are in possession of several of them, they maintain that giants never existed and have never been discovered. David Hatcher Childress wrote, To those who investigate allegations of archaeological cover-ups, there are disturbing indications that the most important archaeological institute in the United States, the Smithsonian Institute, an independent federal agency, has been actively suppressing some of the most interesting and important archaeological discoveries made in the Americas, the Vatican has long been accused of keeping artifacts and ancient books in their vast cellars without allowing the outside world to access them. Sadly, there is overwhelming evidence that something very similar is happening with the Smithsonian Institution. Ivan T. Sanderson, a famous zoologist and frequent Johnny Carson guest, told the story of an army engineer stationed on the Aleutian Islands of Shemya during World War II who sent him a fascinating letter. The man claimed to have uncovered a giant graveyard when building an airstrip bulldozing through sedimentary rock in 1944. He found skulls which measured from 22 to 24 inches from base to crown, nearly three times the size of a typical adult human skull. He entrusted them to the Smithsonian Institute, where they were never to be seen again. He wrote to Sanderson, Is it that these people cannot face rewriting all the textbooks? When Spiro Mound in Oklahoma was excavated in the 1930s, an eight-foot-tall giant in full armor was discovered along with a treasure of pearls and other jewels. The Smithsonian Institute was directly involved in the cover-up of this and many other ancient mounds of the Midwest which were dug up. Archaeologist and researcher David Hatcher Childress reported on one Smithsonian employee who lost his job for exposing evidence that the Smithsonian had at least once taken a barge full of unusual artifacts out and dumped them in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. David Hatcher Childress wrote, Perhaps the most amazing suppression of all is the excavation of an Egyptian tomb by the Smithsonian itself in Arizona. A lengthy front-page story of the Phoenix Gazette on April 5, 1909, gave a highly detailed report of the discovery and excavation of a rock-cut vault by an expedition led by Professor S. A. Jordan of the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian, however, claims to have absolutely no knowledge of the discovery or its discoverers. The area around 94 Mile Creek and Trinity Creek had areas with names like Tower of Set, Tower of Ra, Horus Temple, Osiris Temple, and Isis Temple. In the Haunted Canyon area were such names as the Cheops Pyramid, the Buddha Cloister, Buddha Temple, Manu Temple, and Shiva Temple. Was there any relationship between these places and the alleged Egyptian discoveries in the Grand Canyon? We called a state archaeologist at the Grand Canyon and were told that the early explorers had just liked Egyptian and Hindu names, but that it was true that this area was off-limits to hikers and other visitors because of dangerous caves. Indeed, this entire area, with Egyptian and Hindu place names in the Grand Canyon, is a forbidden zone. No one is allowed into this large area. We could only conclude that this was the area where the vaults were located. I believe that the discerning reader will see that if only a small part of the Smithsonian Gate evidence is true, then our most hallowed archaeological institution has been actively involved in suppressing evidence for advanced American cultures, evidence for ancient voyages of various cultures to North America, evidence for anomalistic giants and other oddball artifacts, and evidence that tends to disprove the official dogma that is now the history of North America. Gary Nelson wrote, Recently, I took a trip to Peru, and guess what jumped out at me in some of the museums I visited there? Yes, it was giants. In Peru, they are not whisked away like they are in the USA. 
It should be noted that there have been hundreds of giant discoveries in the USA that have been either ignored or taken into custody by the Smithsonian, never to be seen again. The Incas actually had kings that were giants, and had red and blonde hair. In the Gold Museum in Lima, you can still see the clothing and head of an Incan king who stood an easy ten feet tall. His dried and mummified head is easily twice the size of mine, and I am not a little person.